Hi curious people, Maudia Yunda here and welcome back to Spotlight. And this is quite a special episode because I have here with me COO of Reku, <laughs> investor and also my husband Jesse. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> this feels a little funny because, um, well, I'll be interviewing you but also we'll just keep it cash. Yeah. We'll chat, yeah. as we always do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let me start with this. Here's a, here's a fun um, piece of data. Apparently, three in four couples mention financial decisions as a source of tension hmm. in their relationship. Hmm. I'm not surprised. You're not surprised? That it's so high, no. Yeah. It's yeah. a tricky topic. It is a tricky topic. Um, and one of the questions that I have here is, did we ever have the big financial conversation before we got married? Did we ever talk about our finances and how did we approach that conversation? Yeah, we did. We did, yeah. We did, but I don't think it was just one conversation. Yeah. I think that'd be kind of weird. That would like, be weird. It's like an interview, it's like boom, one time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we had it across many many different conversations. I think for us the biggest thing is not really like the very tactical things but it's more like philosophically yeah. how do you want to, what kind of financial life do you want to lead going forward? Because mm -hmm. I think two people even though they might be similar and we're pretty similar in the grand scheme but also different mm -hmm. enough where it's not exactly the same. So there's some amount of just realigning that needs to happen, right? Yeah. In order to... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I had a I had a sense of what ideally my partner would be like in terms of, you know, their financial mindset, their philosophy around money, and I was able to get snippets of that all throughout the relationship because you you talk to your partner about a lot of things, right? Like where you go out to dinner that day, like how you split the bill, you know, who's paying for what, whatever it is. And so you do you do get to practice a little yeah. bit, right? So how am I different from your ideal <laughs> <laughs> or the person that I, you said? Um, <laughs> you know, I I definitely remember I definitely remember that I wanted someone who wasn't transactional, you know? Yeah. And so I really appreciated that conversations around money, like, oh, who pays this time or whatever, it was just pretty seamless and easy with you. It's not like, oh, I paid the last three times like you should pay now you know it's, yeah. it's not like that and you don't like keep track but also you're conscious and you do care about spending wisely and not you know yeah. not crazily overspending and so I like that balance because sometimes when people are so so frugal they're also more tight and less generous yeah. and you're not like that yeah. that's what I was looking for yeah. what about you well I've gotten less like that since being with you too. Yeah. We were on kind of, yeah, further away and then we got closer together for sure. But you're a little bit more generous and I think you know how to think about where to spend as needed. Mm. And you believe that, well, one of the differences I think between us at the beginning was I think you saw money as more of a tool, which I think is the right way to think about it. It's sometimes meant to be saved and sometimes meant to be spent. But for me, I think I came from always, it's meant to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And you know, you talk about, I got a lot of pleasure out of like, good deals. All right. Jesse loves yeah. good deals. I love a good deal. And, and I respect that. But yeah, and then, but then, you know, after getting to know you, after spending more time with you, I think I'm also learning to be a little bit more thoughtful. In, in a different way. In a different way. I'm, more, I'm learning to be more thoughtful about having a healthier relationship with, with money and with. spending as needed and mm -hmm. saving as needed and seeing it as a tool mm -hmm. and I think you're, you're maybe you're definitely what you mean by thoughtful is a little bit more of seeing the different tools to become a little bit more financially conservative maybe yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, something like that yeah I, th I think you you're letting yourself derive happiness from the things that you can buy or achieve or yeah. get via money right you know, and in the past you struggled with that. Yeah. And then with me, yeah, um, I've really gained in terms of becoming more financially conservative because I used to want to buy things on a whim. 
<laughs> you know, buying things on a whim sometimes yeah. just because it's attractive to you then, just because, you know, you can maybe see yourself using it once or twice is enough reason to get that thing. No. Um, and you just set a higher bar for me in terms of <laughs> why you should be buying that thing, right? Like, I know that a lot of girls here could probably relate, but to this day, whenever like I see like a nice purse or a nice bag or a nice like shirt, Jesse would very kindly remind me of... <laughs> very kindly. <laughs> very kindly remind me of the many substitutes I have at home. Like, oh, you have, you have a shirt exactly like that at home. And I'm like, what shirt? I have nothing of the sort. <laughs> it might be a different shade or it might be a slightly different cut, but yeah, I, you know, you're, you're helping me set a higher bar for when I should spend. That's good. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a win-win. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so do you think that financial compatibility is a, is a given? No. Even if you're compatible personality-wise or whatever? No. Well, <laughs> well, when you say personality, one of the things hmm. within personality would reflect in your financial yeah. philosophy, right? So I think yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you probably can't get along with someone super well and then like really not get along with them financially. But anyway, the point being, yeah, I think financial compatibility is quite important, of mm -hmm. course. Because if you're going to be... You said what? Three fourths? What is it? Three fourths. Yeah. Three, three fourths four. of couples have financial issues, mm -hmm. right? Or is a source of tension or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, I mean that's like the, one of the biggest arguments, right? One of the biggest sources of argument. And then for you to be bickering about that every single day, because you talk about, I mean, money involves every single day, right? Mm -hmm. That'd be such a pain in the butt. Yeah. I would really dislike that. So yeah, I actually yeah, think yeah, yeah. I never really thought about it because I don't think I mean we were quite similar. Right? We were quite compatible <laughs> at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Yeah. But if we yeah, weren't, yeah, yeah. I feel like that would be it. It would. Yeah, it would, it would, it would, it would. How has that changed for us? Or how has the way that you view money or the way that we manage money, how has that changed since we got married? I think for me, the biggest thing is, yeah, it's not, it's not about my money. It's actually about our money. Mm -hmm. I, I just think about it much more as, yeah, I, I, I find myself thinking a lot more in terms of maximizing for both of us. And it also makes me m kind of less sensitive in terms of, like you said, about who's paying for what. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Even if it did matter a little bit before, like before we were married, now it really doesn't matter. And then also I think about a lot around, like, if it's just my money, then it's easier for me to define where I'm spending it. For example, if I'm going to school, that's a big cost, right? Mm -hmm. go, to, go to business school, that's a huge cost. And I thought a lot about investing in that. Am, am I spending the money to invest in myself? Is it a good investment? Blah, blah, blah. And now I think about that as what are we spending? What are we saving so that we're investing in us collectively into the future, right? So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's also made my time frame yeah, of thinking about things much I was longer. Say that. Yeah. yeah, I think financially it's made me think more like a unit. Undoubtedly, you're going to have to because there are a lot of like shared assets shared things anyway you know whenever we want to spend a huge amount of anything we have to run it by each other um so yeah i think it helps because you have an accountability buddy too now mm. in terms of your spending and it's that's been really helpful for me yeah. <laughs> for sure. you know um well, I'm, I'm like a, I'm like an investor at heart too. You know, I, every decision that I make is comes down to risk reward, right? Is it a high risk, high reward type of thing, or is it whatever? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that that's before you don't have a. If you're only talking about one life, just my life, right, and my finances, you don't really have a portfolio. All you have is one thing, right? And so you, you're very limited to what you can do. Imagine if you had one dollar, you could spend on one thing. Yeah. But then if you have two people and two dollars, it allows you to. Anyway, play around with different life scenarios. Yeah. Right? And so I find myself thinking a lot more in terms of like, what am I, how am I spending my time now versus how is Maudie spending her time? How is that a different risk yeah. reward? And how might that change going in the future? Whatever. So right now I might be taking a big risk and you might be the more less risky one because we can afford to do that and vice versa. It'll, ch it, you know, it can change and whatever. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, thinking about it more like a portfolio and yeah. longer term is what makes it fun, I think. No, we definitely have talked about that before. Yeah. Um, and having you has made me feel, yeah, just a little bit more empowered around strategizing in that way. And 
we can allow for more room for exploration, you know, when the other's a little bit more set on what they're doing. And yeah, I, ju I, just, I just think that that's kind of like an unexpected perk, for me, unexpected perk of, of being married, yeah. having that versatility. Mm. Another thing that we have kind of talked a lot about is saving for the future versus spending today mm. and making sure that we you know yolo you know we <laughs> we also let ourselves have a good time let ourselves yeah, yeah let ourselves live um where do you where are you on that topic <laughs> yeah. it's an ongoing conversation you guys it's it's not <laughs> over <laughs> yeah where are you at we were talking about the beginning my bias is so historically has been so strongly towards delayed gratification, right? Everything you save for the future, you're living hard now so that you can have a good life later. But this is how yeah, I was raised. Yeah, yeah. And I used to think that that was the right way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think I realized two things. One, I realized that if you live like that for 31 years that I've been alive, if I thought like that every single second for 31 years, then for the next 50, there's just there's a zero percent chance that mentality will change mm -hmm. unless I actually actively make myself change that mentality. So when I'm 81, if I don't do anything, I'm still going to be thinking about how to save for when I'm 82, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah, want yeah. that. That's not yeah, yeah, yeah. And the number two is I think that if you live the way that you do, always living for tomorrow, even if you're trying to optimize for the output of today, you're doing a worse job, right? Because you're just going to burn yourself out or whatever. It's like if you, yeah. if you make yourself unhappy or less happy, then that has a future impact in terms of how good you will be tomorrow. If you wake up tomorrow slightly less yeah. happy, you'll be less good at achieving what you wanted to do both today and tomorrow. So I think I'm realizing that, anyway, this, these are things that I probably should have realized a long time ago, but these are things I'm only realizing kind of now. I say this coming from the context of someone who was all the way on this side in terms of only thinking about tomorrow. I can only say, I'm only saying I'm moving <laughs> in that direction because I, you know, I was all the way over here. Yeah, yeah. If you're already over here, then I don't think you should move that way. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna, uh, that's how I've been changing for sure. That was kind of like my defense, right? When I, you know, when, when I used to spend, on a relative basis, I'm more willing to spend than you. And yeah, my, my defense has always been, well, you know, you, you work hard every day and you need to have some existing system of incentives and rewards in order to keep some amount of motivation, you know. Um, and so, of course, I agree with you, there's a balance to be struck um, and you can't just spend all of your money because then you're, yeah, you're not thinking about your future self. Well, this, yeah, this actually goes I, into psychology yeah. too, a little bit, mm -hmm. but the best way to train someone or yourself or whatever is like the classic like Pavlovian, right? Like if you do a good job, you reward them. So if you're training a dog, you do a good job and you give them a treat. Yeah. But if you give them a treat every single time, it's less effective than if you give it to them randomly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I have I have read that. Yeah, Because yeah, yeah. then they are working not for the intrinsic pleasure or whatever of sitting, but they're working for specifically that treat and it becomes too dependable. Mm. So in the same way, <laughs> that's honestly <laughs> how I think about myself. If I'm training myself, right? I used to be, you never get rewarded. Right, which is also bad, but then you also don't want to reward yourself every single time. Then you're not actually working for the right thing. You have to reward yourself on a <laughs> relatively random <laughs> basis, right? And that's how you actually maximize your... Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. A total yeah. side <laughs> discussion. But. And this makes me reflect on, are you, do you kind of rely on like my gifts as those random incentives? Because Jesse never shops. <laughs> He like literally, like he would say things like, I'm letting myself, you know, spend now and live and, but you, you don't ever shop. I need to carry him or like, I need to drag him into a store and tell him to pick out something. And what you said just made me think of like, hey, like the gifts or like the random stuff I get you are yeah. kind of like <laughs> random incentives for you. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it's not intentional, but it's like, yeah. ooh, like, great, you know, got a new pair of shoes or whatever. Yeah. And it's like coming out of our pocket anyway. So anyway, yeah. it's kind of like you spending too. Are you saying you're the master that's giving the treats <laughs> to the dog right now? <laughs> and I'm the dog? No. What the? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think you're right. <laughs> what the? That's not what I meant. Um, okay. So there's this saying, and I don't know if you've heard of this saying, 
But basically, it's like your money、mm -hmm. is my money, and my money is my money. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds accurate. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding.、Um, what are our thoughts about that? Let me. Can I start? Yeah. Please. <laughs> I'm asking and answering.、Um, <laughs> I get where that where that phrase is coming from, and I think depending on the context, it could work, you know. But I'm coming from a place where I knew that I wanted to be with, you know, an equal partner. I'm going to want to contribute financially, and I know that my partner is also going to want to contribute in other dimensions, whether it's the household or. The kids and you know all of these things will be shared, and so to me this phrase doesn't really apply. You know, your money is our money and my money is our our money. That's kind of where I stand. And I think also we have a very unique context, unique set of experiences where you know when you moved here you were taking a pretty big financial and career risk.、Um, And so it's a little more blurry, and he took that risk for us. And so I was also aware of the fact, and I was also bought in to the fact that you were going to take that risk. And and so I think going forward, yeah, going forward, whatever, whatever I make because of your support and because of the fact that you're here with me, should be ours and vice versa. I don't know.、Mm. Say something. <laughs> I feel like I just lectured.、Um, no, I yeah, of course. I mean, you you of course already know that I agree, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to add? No, I I think、um, yeah, it's a cute saying. It's funny. <laughs> it's a funny saying. It's it's cute. It's, it's cute yeah, and it's funny. cute. But it's it's not as relevant, or it's not it's not actually realistic for us at least. I think I think about it as we put in basically collectively 100% of each of our. Into a pot. This is just how I. Not that there's actually a pot. <laughs> there's no. Yeah. There's no there's real no, pot.、Yeah. There's no cooking.、Uh -huh. But and then and then anyway. So we put it into the pot and then we. Yeah. And then and then the the magic of it is I think all the decisions when you take it out of the pot. All the decisions are made kind of jointly. Some of the things are made. Some of the decisions are made because they benefit me more. Some of them benefit you more. Whatever. Whatever. By the end of the day, I don't think. We're I think we're lucky because we both understand that very intrinsically. That I wouldn't do something with our money that's only benefiting me or only benefiting you or, or even worse, benefiting me but hurting you or whatever, right?、Mm. I, I don't think that that's something that we would do. That's just not what we do. And so, yeah, and so it allows us to I think make decisions that are a lot more, again, longer term and also more interesting. All right, so I want to kind of move further. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people are interested in your journey, views on on finance and, and investing and all that. So、mm -hmm. maybe you should give a little bit of context right now. So so Jesse has had yeah meaningful years in investing. You worked in like a VC P firm. I did a bunch of stuff.、Yeah. You did a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And we did some angel investing out of. Out of business school,、yeah. um, and then now you work in Reku, and you care a lot about investing wisely.、Um, why this fascination、mm. for investing, and how did you get into it in the first place?、Mm. Well, so my first real job, actually,、mm -hmm. well, it's like half real. It was an internship during college, right? But it was my first job, other than. Being a teacher, which I was anyway.、Mm -hmm. Well, actually, maybe that does play into why I care so much about this. But when I was a kid in high school and college, I was a teacher. Internship. Wait, what do you mean by teacher? You taught SATs.、You're、no, you were a tutor, right? I was a tutor, but I also taught classes, like classrooms. Oh, really? Yeah, you didn't know this. So I taught, I taught math, I taught chemistry, like classes of kids. I taught like AP chemistry for over the summer. I also taught golf, like kids, kids. Okay, no, he told、thing. me that. Yeah. You told me about the SATs. I、yeah. never. I was a private tutor. I taught math and chemistry classes、oh. for a summer school thing, and then I taught little kids golf. Hey, this is why you cute. <laughs> okay.、Um, anyway, so maybe that's why I'm so interested in like financial literacy and things like that in general.、Mm. But my first job was actually at at an investment firm. It was like a 
how do you describe it? It's like a wealth management fund, right? So we cater primarily to small businesses and also like high net worth individuals. And then what we got to do, I worked in the investment team of that company. So we would pick out like, you know, specific asset classes and specific yeah. uh, things to be purchasing. So anyway, that was my first job. So I thought that, that was really interesting. That's how I got into investing ultimately. And yeah, I, I've always been interested in it because I think it always came from this it always, since the very beginning, it was baked into not, you're not making, you're not investing to make money or, mm. you know, it's not like that. It's not just day to day little, it's actually, you're talking about a life that you're trying to plan, right? And these families have wives and kids and what, right? Yeah, and, and, a, and like a freedom that you can yeah, achieve, right? Yeah. It's and freedom. You're, you're helping yeah. them set a certain strategy mm. that they can depend on for the rest of their life, right? And that's super, mm -hmm. super powerful. And I think that's kind of how I, that's how I've always seen and that's how investing has always been. Mm -hmm. And then since then, so, and then another, the other, the next investing job I did after that, I worked in private equity, right, in Boston at Bancap. And that one, you're investing in big companies, right, huge companies. And that was really interesting because you get to see basically as an investor, the entire business. You're, you're, you're not just, okay, you, you're not understanding just a small portion of it. You're understanding very deeply and you're working very closely with the teams, right? Mm -hmm. And some of these things are like life-saving drugs or they're like really, really incredible products or whatever. They're like mm -hmm. some of the coolest mm -hmm. companies that you, you ever, you know, you'll ever see. So I felt like that was like really, that's what really gave me kind of more the knowledge of how to invest and maybe more the theory, but also what really got me super excited about yeah. the fundamentals of investing. And then I worked in venture after that, which mm -hmm. is you're much more working closely with the with the entrepreneurs, right? So I got to have a lot more respect for the founders. But yeah, that one is all about mm -hmm. create that alpha in the world, right? So it's a different type of investing, but it's also fascinating in its own way. So anyway, all of that to be said, I'm, I'm very, I think, blessed to have, have had seen a lot of different aspects of investing. But I think every piece of investing that I've seen has really allowed me to get yeah. really interested and deep into yeah. all the yeah. different sectors. So it's been cool. So on a personal level, you know, I'm sure people here are curious about the way that you approach your portfolio now slash our portfolio um, and how we're splitting it into different assets, how we're thinking about it. Um, I will start by saying that individually we had very different portfolios when we first met. Yeah, um, it's true. I had started investing first and foremost in real estate because my parents had a lot of experience in real estate and that's like the asset that I felt most comfortable with. I just, I've grown up hearing about real estate, you know, my mom loves real estate and and so a lot of a lot of my investing was in real estate, whereas you... Yeah, a lot of, I mean, it started with equities. Yeah. And then, and then of course, in, I, was able to co-invest with some of the companies, so it was at a company level, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of crypto, mm -hmm. of course, a lot of like credit, not a lot, I, this is just the portfolio, right? But yeah. equities, crypto, credit, uh, VC, like early stage, mm -hmm. angel investing, things like that. But I never touched hard stuff, hard assets, yeah. like real estate or <laughs> like commodities or macro like FX. I, I, I never really understood that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I never really touched it. And that was, I think, more your, yeah, yeah, more yeah. your camp. And so when we got together, even more diversified, yeah. you know, it was yeah. like, it's, so that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah. And then of course, given that Jesse has had experience investing in all those other financial assets, I, I became more comfortable and I, 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 you know, yeah. I think, I think especially crypto, you, you, you kind of, got pretty deep into crypto in the second year of business school. Is mm. that right? Before even that. before that? Yeah. Okay. Sure. But like even more properly in yeah, the second yeah. year, right? That was like when like I was really had, considering like were, doing something in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. You went quite deep. Yeah. Can you, can you, you know, now, now you're with Reku. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, crypto is fascinating, right? I think crypto really breaks a lot of the, the norms or like the, the typical things you'd see in investing. Right, and I think this is probably how a lot of investment classes started. Um, they all start as people are working every day to try to create the right frameworks in terms of understanding it. Mm. And it's not something that no one invents, like you don't invent stocks of companies and then also invent like the exact way to value them or whatever, right? This, these things take a lot of time. And so I think crypto is one of those asset classes that are 
quite, yeah, I mean, quite revolutionary in a lot of ways. And it's also new enough where there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. I think the fundamental thing that I really think is really cool about crypto is, if you imagine like a utopian world where, you know, you're in the future and everything just works around you and things just happen and, you know, it seems like the universe somehow knows that you want to go somewhere so there's a car that's ready to go or whatever, right? The point being, I have no idea why I brought this up, <laughs> but the point being, I think that there's a future version of the world where we're not dependent on companies or specific people to make the right decisions for us. Mm -hmm. Instead, a lot of that trust and that logic is built into society, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this relate to crypto? Basically, crypto is trying to address each indus industry in that way. And so, like for example, we talk about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is the most well-known crypto asset. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin allows for the transfer of wealth without someone in the middle. It does that just purely based on its own technology that's impossible to break. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a bank telling me, I sent to the bank and I'm trusting that the bank sends you something. It happens directly mm -hmm. through Bitcoin mm -hmm. on the blockchain. And I don't have, I'm not gonna go into exactly how it happens, but it's completely trustless, but it's imp impenetrable. It's impossible to break. And this is just within finance, but there's a lot of industries where it's disrupting like that. Yeah, where yeah, you're basically, it's super cool. Yeah, you're, ta you're taking trust and you're putting it into software. Mm -hmm. That's like the fundamental of crypto. All the institutions that require trust today put it directly, inherently into the software. I think that that's probably a vision that's not, it's been lost or just kind of not super well understood. But that's like how- Like the actual like, the technology and like the vision of yeah, what that could be right, right has been lost right and yeah. now i think you're in a world in crypto where unfortunately you're there's a bunch of people who really understand the technology they're very in the weeds and they are late they're up to speed in terms of what the latest projects are and things like that and then there's like a huge group of people who yeah misunderstand it and they 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 don't understand the asset for what it is. They don't actually understand much about it, but they want to participate because it's, an, it's a high risk, high reward asset class. And a lot of people in the past have made money from it. And so they want to participate, but those people are putting themselves at risk mm -hmm. right? because they're doing something that they don't actually understand. And this is, this is a technology that's very hard to understand, mm -hmm. to be honest. I mean, it's, it's it, like we talked about, it breaks a lot of kind of fundamental ways of thinking about things. So, so for people out there, because I had to go, you know, when I was asking Jesse about, okay, what's, you know, what's crypto all about, you know, originally second year of business school, like all these things, like he actually told me to like read up on it on my own too, because it's impossible to just understand it in just one conversation, right? Yeah. You kind of have to actively want to learn and, and then go deep into it yeah there's yeah. enough nuance in there where it's yeah it's not easy to understand yeah you know imagine trying to explain to someone in the 1600s what the internet is it's impossible mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you're just not mm -hmm. going to get there in one conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now i'm not saying it's it's that dramatic but it's the same thing when someone yeah. you know 10 years ago if you're explaining crypto to somebody it doesn't make any sense to them. it just doesn't yeah i mean now I, I i'm a little i'm a little afraid that the world has kind of lost its uh desire to really dive deep and understand it. But the reality is, it is an asset class that is resilient. It's a real asset class. It's been through several ups and downs and it's survived and it's come out stronger. So there's no question that it's a legitimate asset class. But the, the question is actually around, do you understand it? Mm -hmm. And can you turn it into something that helps you, not just hurts you or is seen as a Okay. You know, as a yeah. as a scam or seen as something that's yeah. only negative, yeah. which is not. Yeah, right, that's yeah. the that's the that's the situation. So I mean, that's what we're trying to do at, at Record, right? And this is this is kind of my belief in terms of why financial literacy is so important. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to bring my vision of believing that financial literacy is important and bringing it to investing. And when you do that, you're creating a win-win scenario. You're creating a scenario where I'm helping make the world a better place by helping you know, bringing our content, like we have a research team, right? Mm -hmm. Who makes great daily content. We're tr I'm trying to bring that content to you because it'll help you become a better investor, right? And so, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. this is something that we really pride ourselves on in terms of this vision of becoming yeah. Indonesia's guide to wiser investing. That's what we always say. Yeah. And um, we think that, yeah, we think that there's in finance, there's probably nothing more noble. Yeah. Than than doing that. Yeah, I I really like that wiser investing, bijak um, berinvestasi in bahasa. Um, so tactically speaking, to to all the curious people out there who are looking to invest um, in crypto, where should they start? You know, and and this and maybe you can talk a little bit about resources out there or within the Reku platform. But yeah, where where should they start? How should they go about it? Um, how should they build that understanding? Mm, yeah, I think there's a few things. One, I think first you should get up to speed. You should l learn mm -hmm. more. And I think that learning more doesn't mean it has to be very difficult or it has to be like homework. Honestly, yeah. there's a lot of, just to plug, right? At Rec, we try really hard to make sure that a lot of the content is very is very fun and natural to digest. Mm -hmm. Right. So for example, we have a, we have a product on our app um, where we basically ask people to predict, right? What's going to happen in the future in mm. terms of is this something as simple as is the price of this asset going to go up or down, or is there going to be some kind of development in this project or whatever? But the key is then we tell you what people who are generally right, so the people who are more often right than wrong, we tell you what their answers are. So you're basically you're playing the game, but you're also learning from other people who yeah. know better than you, right? Things like that, like yeah. that's community that's a, element. Yeah. yeah, and that's the kind of stuff that we want to be doing more of, and that's what we're trying to do. So. Number one, I would say find a platform that is credible, has the right research team, has the right, you know, whatever you want in it. That and complies with the regulations. Of course. Yeah. And then, and then make sure that you're at least loosely keeping up to speed, right? Mm -hmm. And if that platform happens to be Raku, great. <laughs> that's, yeah. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. So that's like in terms of just kind of like literacy. Mm -hmm. Number two is it, when you're talking about actually selecting a platform, is finding one that is fully compliant, not just has the right licenses, but actually is in their DNA mm. to care about user protection, to care about compliance, about doing things the right way. Yeah, I mean, I'm, as of now, I'm proud to say Raku is the most compliant, right? We actually helped develop the regulations for one of our, pla uh, one of our products, a staking product, mm -hmm. which is a passive mm -hmm. income product. And we worked with Bapipti to create that. Mm -hmm. And currently, we report to them every single day, and we are the only ones who have that license, right? Everyone else who offers something like this technically is doing it uncompliantly. So anyway, picking a platform, I think, that mm -hmm. really emphasizes user protection and user literacy, all these things that we're talking about, I think are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing, I think, is just kind of like, maybe more like mentally or emotionally. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think you kind of have to be prepared to be patient. It's, it's an, again, it's an asset class that is inherently revolutionary it'll take a long time to for people to fully understand it mm -hmm. and for you as an individual investor it'll take a lot of time for you to yeah really wrap your head around what are the different projects that are going on and what is the risk profile and what exactly yeah is going on in the space but there's more to crypto than just the good stuff wow it went up a hundred percent in one day i'm so happy yeah and there's yeah, more to crypto more than, than all the bad it's stuff too that, yeah it's, it's not just all the negative sentiment too there's nothing in there's nothing that's that good or that bad mm. it's just something it's a matter of being patient and understanding mm. and if you find the right partner and the right platform to be able to do that then i think you'll be successful if not then yeah, yeah. i think you'll have a harder yeah. time yeah 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 i like that I like the three tips um how much of your portfolio is in crypto Mm. Roughly, like I'm sure, well, or like, or maybe, <laughs> or maybe just kind of like, how much ideally, mm. or how much would you want to in your head? Because I'm, I'm sure we don't we don't have the exact number, but yeah. You assuming that I don't work at a crypto company? Oh I mean, right, because you're my whole my whole you know blood, sweat, and tears is is going towards that. So a hundred percent. So it'd be like hundred ten percent. But if you're not talking about that, assuming I don't, assuming you're just talking about purely my assets. Right. Right. In crypto broadly, I would say probably like 30 to 50% of my portfolio is in crypto. Within that, there are probably times when I'm moving it between one or the other. If I find a project that I'm really interested in, or I have more time to really understand more projects so I can invest in more projects, I would do that. Mm -hmm. If I have less time, then I'm more likely to lean into some of the more blue chip, you know, your typical Bitcoin and Ethereum and, you know, these names that are a little bit more stable, right? Right. a little bit right. lower risk. Right. Right. But yeah, I would say at any given point, 30 to 50%. 
Okay, so 30 to 50. Okay, that's that's actually pretty high. Um, yeah. How would you... Okay, let's, let's make sure everyone here knows what type of investor are you and what's your risk profile, right. given that, you know, proportion right. that you just mentioned. Right. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's, there's both the fact that I'm into crypto and I'm a believer. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's also the fact that you're talking about. In terms of my risk profile uh -huh. and like my, my personality yeah, when yeah, it comes yeah. to investing, I think it's quite aggressive, mm -hmm. I would say. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a quite a high-risk investor. Aggressive. Yeah, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a high risk, aggressive investor, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What that means is basically, yeah, I mean, I like to be smart around what to invest in, but generally if I find something that I really like, if there's a good chance that it has a lot of return, but it also has a good chance that it's zero, like it's, you know, very wide range, I like those in general. Yeah. I like shooting yeah, for the yeah, stars. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I think that, of course, there are times when you have to be conservative. Mm -hmm. And in, in certain, you can even think about aggressive versus conservative in different, in, within asset classes. But in general, I'm quite an aggressive investor. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like investing in startups. I like doing angel. Angel's got to be one of the most risky types of investing that you can do, right? Angel investing in startups. Yeah, and I do think it's pretty important to be self-aware or to understand where, where, where you're at and yeah. what your risk profile is. Yeah. Um, I think it's super important. I would say it's one of the most important things because I don't think you want to you want to be, if you believe that you're a lower, you're a more conservative investor, you probably don't want to be listening too much to someone like me in terms of what tactically to invest in. Maybe, yeah. My point being, if I'm suggesting very specific investments to you, you don't want to be taking the same ones if you have a different risk profile. Right, right, right. right. So actually, along this line, Reku's actually developed a personality test. Investor personality a, a, a test. Investor personality test that's primarily yeah, based around yeah. risk risk profile, but also a little bit around your aptitude for diversification, things like that, some other right, stuff. Right, right. So we've developed it. And so and, and so from there, um, people can identify the, the investor personality they are, and yeah. then from there they can kind of choose exactly the types of things, with, even within crypto, that they can invest in, right? Because even yeah. within crypto, there's there's a range. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so yeah. what we'll do, if you, if you take the quiz, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll I want to. go home, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll make you take <laughs> the quiz. He's gonna make me take the quiz, <laughs> I will. <laughs> but when we, you know, if you take the quiz, it shows you, this is generally, this is a suggested approach to how you should build yeah. your whole portfolio, not just crypto, mm. whole portfolio. And then within crypto, that's where we're the experts, right? This is what we suggest that you might, how you might build the, Mm. the portfolio within crypto based on your risk profile. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we kind of lay a lot of that out. It's not meant to be, you don't just do it blindly. Yeah. We, we want this to be a starting point for you to right. do a little bit more research and whatever, right. whatever. But this and, is a suggested starting mm. point. And I do think, unlike your actual personality, this could change depending mm. on where you're at in your yeah. um, financial, or like your, yeah, your, your financial journey, right? You could become, you could become more aggressive For over sure. time or less aggressive depending on the context so so i have this thing in the program where we come up with kind of three takeaways three things we want to close the mm. the episode with but i wanted to do it together with you because a lot of the conversations that we had today were kind of collaborative anyway mm -hmm. um so you can start. <laughs> what do I, what do, <laughs> I do? It so it's just, you know, let's just end with kind of three takeaways that we thought was interesting from our conversation today that people can also take home with them and kind of mull over, maybe reflect on some of these points. Point one, my money's my money, your money's my money. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it from Spotlight. Good night. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay. Point one, uh, you know you what, start, I'll, start. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I think um, on the topic that we started with today around finances and marriage and all that, I, th I, think, I think one takeaway is that it's customized. It's customized to your context, to your relationship. Um, but what's most important to, is to have that conversation, is to be having those conversations and to align. Um, I'm realizing as we were having the conversation that a lot of a lot of the stuff we brought up were very specific to the way we were brought up you know our our vision of and what we want to achieve collectively 
And yeah, and so I don't know if I want to take anything from that specific conversation as like a thing that people should apply and definitely think through some of the things we spoke about. But yeah, it's important to communicate. Um, yeah, one of the best financial decisions you'll make. <gasps> yeah. Is the life partner you'll pick. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Sheryl Sandberg, lean in. Oh, that's Sheryl Sandberg? Yeah. Oh, I thought I was being original. No, I think Sheryl Sandberg said the best business or professional or something, some yeah, decision yeah, yeah. that's not financial, but it's kind of along those same lines. And I, and I do agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to bring this up. But yeah, I, I think especially as someone who, who wants to have a career in the longer run, and, but I also want a family and all those things. For me, having a partner who's supportive and who wants to meet me halfway and all the other dimensions, is really important because otherwise it's inevitable I might have to compromise on you know career and all these other things and and so yeah. <laughs> nice anyway um, point two well okay point two I think you have to you have to care about your own financial literacy right mm. it's not something that necessarily comes super easy and I think you can probably tell in this conversation that it's something that we take very intentional Mm -hmm. Right. We could choose to not take it so intentional, but I think we believe that the more seriously you take it, the more you invest your own time and understanding in terms of improving your literacy, I think it pays off. And so I would say, yeah, just have the, the I don't want to sound too preachy, but like, yeah, have the, I think it's good to have the discipline. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, I think it's a good thing for most people to spend more time thinking about mm -hmm. their own literacy mm -hmm. and their own understanding and their own planning process and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and third point, um, I think invest wisely with Reku. <laughs> 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 um, anything, nice. anything you want to say to add to that? It has to be that same point. Use Reku because? Yeah, because we do things right. <laughs> we, we do things right. We, we really care about trying to do things right and trying, to do, just, trying yeah. to do best by. Yeah, by our users, you know. I'm, I mean, and honestly, and and it's secure and reliable. Yeah, and we work, yeah. you know, we work with all the right people, and we make sure that users are protected. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really here to. I mean, the the, <laughs> the focus of this series and this episode is to help yeah. illustrate financial literacy broadly, right? But it's something that me personally and the company really cares about, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's what drives us to do what we do. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and for curious people who are listening here, even if you're a beginner, um, what I love about Reku is you have a light and pro mode. And so the, the platform actually caters to different, you know, different levels. And so you shouldn't feel intimidated and you should just go ahead and try it out and download in you know, the Play Store, App Store. And we're also gonna give a link down here in the description below. There's also a learning hub, and I'm all about learning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I stand for. Um, and so, again, if you're just starting out, or if you're, you know, if you're, if you're kind of like a moderate um, level, you can you can still gain a lot from just learning new things on on Reku's learning hub. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks for coming to chat with me today. Thanks. It was and thank fun. you, Reku, for supporting um, this series, Financial Literary Series. And yeah. Yeah. That's it. Thanks for coming to work with me today. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right. Bye. And that's the end of the series. Terima kasih banyak untuk Reku yang sudah mensupport Financial Literacy Series ini. Dan thank you juga buat curious people for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that it was useful. Dan untuk spotlight season berikutnya, aku pengen banget dapat ideas dari kalian. Topik apa ya kira-kira yang mau kita angkat? Please write in the comments below. Let me know what you want to go deep about. Bye!